call me cause I can't go Someone's wrong on the internet, don't you know? So let's uh, bring up Larry, Larry Barker. Most everybody knows Larry Barker from his uh, investigative reports on KRQE TV 13. Larry's been around for, for years and years. He's worked um, several uh, segments uh, that we collaborated with him on. One of my uh, favorite was the, uh, I don't think he's showing it today, but the uh, magnetic water conditioners, our, our treasurer, Nancy Shelton, uh, wore a wire and we um, purchased a, uh, a magnet that was supposed to keep your air conditioner from ever uh, getting uh, clouded up with uh, CLR, calcium lime, and rust. Uh, and they didn't work, but that was um, a great little report. And um, I really enjoyed the uh, sort of secret agent uh, spy aspect of it all. So without further ado, uh, Larry Barker, come on up. Every, I think most of you know what I do because you, I've been on TV for a long time, uh, uh, just about um, 48 years. And I deal in facts. That's, that's all I really know. I, I have my opinions, I guess, on, on things um, and on the news, but that's not what you see on TV. I can only deal in facts. So when you look at a subject where there are no facts, is that newsworthy? Is it real? So if you do a story on a, um, uh, some uh, government official who's uh, stealing public money or misfitting public money, you can, uh, you can look at uh, uh, vouchers, you can look at uh, receipts, you can look at uh, uh, all kinds of documents, and if they did it, you can prove it. Those are the facts. Now, if somebody comes to me and, and with an allegation that some government official has been stealing public money, first thing I, I say is, well, how do you know that? Well, I saw it. Or somebody told me. Well, that's not good enough for me. I've got to see it. If I can't prove it, then I don't run it. So I'll get, I'll get the receipts, and I'll get the vouchers, and I'll, I'll get uh, all kinds of documents, and I'll look at them, and I'll evaluate it. And maybe I'll look at the, all those documents and see, well, there's a perfectly logical explanation for the loss of that money, but it clearly didn't go in this government official's pocket. So do I do the story? Of course not, because I can't prove it. Remember, if I can't prove it, I don't run it. So, and that, by the way, that happens all the time, is we, we look at uh, many, many more things, uh, news stories, than we actually run. Because uh, more often than not, we can't prove it. You know, maybe that government official did steal the money, but we can't find the facts. We can't prove it. Well, if we can't prove it, we don't run it. So, let's go back. Uh, some 20 years ago, I, I became acquainted with the folks uh, with this organization, uh, Ben, Dave, and uh, they, they educated me about some subjects out there, things like UFOs and uh, mythical monsters and things like that, and said, that would be a good subject for us to investigate. Well, it's an unusual subject, but there's a lot of public interest, a lot of believers out there, and the facts, either the facts are there 
or they're not. So the first story I did was, um, it was just almost 20 years ago, it's on channel 13, and it had to do with the Aztec incident. Now, probably most of you are familiar with what the Aztec incident is. Is there anybody who doesn't know what the Aztec incident is? Okay. The Aztec incident was the crash landing of a uh, flying saucer in the uh, Farmington Aztec area. And supposedly, I'm, I can't remember the timing on this. Was it before Roswell or after Roswell? Uh, 1948, so a year after Roswell. Okay, so it was about the same time as Roswell, uh, roughly. Uh, it didn't get the publicity, and when you see our story, you'll see how the story developed. Um, but uh, if you live in the Farmington Aztec area, and you've been there a while, you've heard of the Aztec incident because they have, it's, it's their local lore, just like Roswell, except it just hasn't received the publicity. Uh, but we found there's a, uh, there's an, they used to have an annual uh, Aztec incident festival every year, and people would flock to Aztec and they'd, they'd buy all kinds of, um, you know, plastic flying saucers and, and uh, little green men and, and they'd have seminars and they'd have experts on UFOs come in and, and um, they do a symposium and it was a big deal in Farmington. But we heard about it. So we decided we will, we will apply the same principles we do to every single one of our invest, in, investigative stories to Aztec and see, is it real? Did it really happen? Well, we went, we approached it with, uh, with that question. First thing we did, gather the facts. What really happened? Did it happen? Maybe it did. But what you will see here is the results of our investigation. And I will tell you, this in, I've been doing this for almost 48 years. This is my favorite story, what you're going to see right here. It is no longer uh, available on the KRQE website. So um, if you didn't see it when it aired uh, uh, 20 years ago, um, you'll see it for the first time. But you will see why it is my, one of my favorite stories of all time. It is informative. It's fair. It's honest, and it's entertaining. But so Dave, let's, let's do uh, Aztec. This is KRQE News 13 with Dignifying and Erica Ruiz. What happened in New Mexico in the late 1940s is the most important scientific discovery ever. Or it is a preposterous criminal hoax. And no, it didn't happen near Roswell. We're talking about another UFO, other space aliens and a heck of a story. Here's News 13 investigative reporter Larry Barker. There was this large 100-foot um, lens-shaped disc that had come down and crashed on the Mesa. Today, there are living aliens in Los Alamos. If it really happened, it'd, it would be one of the most extraordinary events in the history of humanity. They're not talking Roswell. This is Aztec, New Mexico the crash landing of an alien spacecraft nearly 60 years ago on a remote mesa east of Farmington. Retired Air Force officer Wendell Stevens co-authored a book about it. A disc-shaped vehicle out of control came in and made a, an emergency landing here. You probably haven't heard about the Aztec incident because UFO believers say the whole thing's been covered up by the government. But the story goes something like this. May 25th, 1948, just east of Aztec in the Four Corners region. A large disc-shaped UFO is picked up on military radar as it makes its way here over Hart Canyon. The 
strange object flies erratically. It disappears in the trees and then crashes on the mesa top. Inside, 16 dead aliens. Linda Moulton Howe is a UFO investigator. What did the aliens look like? To my best knowledge, there's never been any details ever. Just that there were non-human bodies, no details. Oil field workers are the first on the scene. The military did show up and individually sat and talked with everybody, swore them to secrecy, and uh, whisked them all away. The spaceship was described as being silver, lens-shaped, with no portholes. Now, believers say it measured exactly 99.9 .9 feet in diameter. That would have made the alien craft as big as a 10-story building and would cover almost a third of this football field. As the story goes, a special military intelligence team mounted a secret recovery operation. The huge saucer was hoisted onto a transport and taken overland the 120 miles to Los Alamos. And they went overland because the object was too big to carry over highways and they couldn't get it under overpasses and over bridges and things like that. The alien bodies were taken to Los Alamos also. Today, some 60 years later, believers say the government continues to keep what happened here a big fat secret. If there ever was evidence here in Hart Canyon, it's long since disappeared. There's no credible witnesses, no newspaper stories, no reports, no photographs, no spaceships, and no little aliens. Ken Fraser is editor of a scientific journal, The Skeptical Inquirer. Do you think our government would have the ability to cover up the whole thing so nobody would find out what happened? No, not in anything except a very short term. Second, why would they? It would be an extraordinary discovery. Dave Thomas heads up New Mexicans for Science and Reason. Did an alien spacecraft crash in Aztec at any time? No. If there really is evidence that could prove a UFO has landed, I'd love to see it. Show me the money. In fact, the whole Aztec story is part of an elaborate hoax cooked up more than 50 years ago by two con men posing as scientists, Silas Newton and Leo Gebauer. Their scheme unraveled in 1952 after a reporter exposed the scam in this magazine article. Newton and Gebauer later were convicted of fraud in Denver. With Roswell, there was actually an uh, actual event that one could point to as starting it. Here, it was a fake story from the very beginning. There was no evidence ever, and there still isn't. But the Aztec saucer story did not die with Newton and Gebauer's conviction. The tale was resurrected more than 30 years later with the publication in 1985 of Wendell Stevens' expose. Some of the evidence in this book has been proven to be uh, fraudulent, not from the government, made by somebody who had a story to tell. But the lack of scientific evidence has not stopped promoters from keeping the Aztec close encounter alive. Today, there are a host of books, articles, DVDs, and alien trinkets, all celebrating Aztec's brush with creatures from outer space. Even the Aztec community is cashing in with its own annual alien celebration. The desire to believe in all sorts of wild imaginary things like flying saucers and uh, extraterrestrial beings visiting us, it's a compelling story. People want it to be real and there are always people who are going to promote that. Despite all evidence to the contrary, Scott Ramsey, Linda Moulton Howe and Wendell Stevens still believe alien visitors actually crashed here. They remain convinced that some secret government building still houses a 100-foot-wide spacecraft and the mangled bodies of 16 ETs. In my mind, it's 100% valid. It did happen. Dave, what's it going to take for the Aztec UFO believers to simply go away? I think it would take the Venusians to come down and tell us, you know, they didn't really land there in Hart Canyon in 48. Truth is something I care a lot about, and I also do uh, appreciate uh, entertainment and good stories, but let's not confuse the two. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. Oh, nice. yeah. Yeah. So I, I think you can see why that was my favorite story of all time, is all we did is look for the facts. 
There's not one shred of evidence. To just There's not one shred of evidence that it ever happened. Yet, the believers believe it did. There's nothing we can say or we can do that will change people's minds. If they believe it, it happened. You see it at Roswell. You see it on lots of, uh, lots of things that are occurring today. Um, but all we did is our presentation, uh, highly entertaining. Of course, we uh, uh, heavily used a lot of graphics because I mean, there was no flying saucer. There was no uh, dead aliens. Um, and, and, and some of the things that they were saying, I mean, it, they're just so ludicrous. Um, you know, Wendell Stevens says that the spaceship was, when it crash landed, that it was too big to bring over the roads and under the bridges and stuff. So they took it um, 120 miles across country to Los Alamos, which is where it is today. Unbelievable. So fast forward uh, a number of years. Um, uh, I think it was uh, about 10 years ago, we decided that we would take a look at the Roswell incident. Now, we didn't set out to debunk uh, the Roswell incident. Uh, we can't do that. Um, but we, we found out, and this is really interesting, that the University of New Mexico actually did an archaeological excavation at the purported site of the Roswell spacecraft crash. A legitimate scientific expedition looking for evidence of the Roswell crash. And when we found out that the University of New Mexico had used public resources to look at whether a uh, craft, spacecraft crashed near Roswell, well, that's where we got involved. And uh, once again, all we did is look at the facts and present what we know and what we can prove. Uh, Again, a um, highly ent entertaining but informative story. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, I think you will um, you will get a kick out of this one. Millions of people believe that there is a vast conspiracy to cover up the truth about the Roswell incident. But if a flying saucer really did crash on a New Mexico ranch, shouldn't modern science now be able to find evidence? Well, not many people are aware of it, but a team of UNM archaeologists conducted an intensive search for exactly that. Tonight, News 13 investigative reporter Larry Barker has the story of what they did and what they found. Believe me, if you go to Outer Mongolia and say Roswell, the response from people who don't speak a word of English will be UFO. How many research projects have you done that relate to UFOs and flying saucers? This was the only one. Maybe UNM should consider changing the name of the College of Arts and Sciences to the College of Art and Science Fictions. You know the story. Aliens crashed their spaceship near Roswell the government secretly recovers the debris and a handful of dead ETs. Then the whole thing is covered up. It's either the most important event in human history or one whopper of a tall tale. We have come to visit you in peace. Did it happen? Sorry, Roswell, but there's no scientific proof a flying saucer ever plowed into the New Mexico prairie. There's no GPS, photos, recordings, debris, or Little green men, for that matter. Zilch. Nothing. Nada. It's going to take more than the faded memories of a few old-timers to turn skeptics into believers. What the UFO community badly needs is scientific evidence. 
And that's where the University of New Mexico enters the picture. Dick Chapman is director of UNM's Office of Contract Archaeology. We engaged in a highly credible standard archaeological investigation of a, a, a piece of landscape that has been warranted to be the location of a flying saucer event. Yep, you heard it right. UNM on the trail of Roswell's aliens. I thought, wow, this is a real hoot. This is going to be interesting. UNM's Bill what? Dolman headed Where up the project, which was featured in a TV documentary narrated Gumbel by Bryant Gumbel. Archaeologists from the University of New Mexico have returned to Roswell with a unique new mission to use the tools of modern science to prove or disprove what some claim is science fiction. We are digging holes in the ground to look for physical evidence of an extraterrestrial vessel impact. Armed with shovels, trowels, and backhoes, UNM dug up a nine-acre piece of prairie northwest of Roswell. The summed evidence from the hearsay level knowledge that really points to this spot as being the a recognized uh, potential crash site. So of a UFO. Based on that, of a UFO. UNM's excavation was funded entirely by the Sci-Fi Channel. TV executives paid UNM thousands of dollars to put the alien crash site under a microscope. We did not go out there looking to prove the existence of a UFO crash at that location in 1947. We went out there to look for evidence of the events that were reported to have happened. UNM probed the prairie in 2002. This past May, the university published its final report. It's a document steeped in controversy. I love science fiction, but that's not what the research division of a university should be putting out. Dave Thomas is a physicist at New Mexico Tech. He also heads up an organization that promotes the use of science in examining unusual claims. I think they did get sucked into you know, what basically was a, a massive exercise in, in pseudoscience. The validity of UNM's alien dig is predicated on the assumption that a UFO really did crash. And where it ended up is absolutely critical. You see, if a flying saucer crashed over there, but UNM dug here, then the entire exercise is pointless. If you dug in the wrong place, then what's the value of your excavation? Not much. Sci-Fi Channel really wanted to go dig at the Roswell crash site. The question is, as you put it, where is it? How did you choose the site? We didn't. It was chosen for us. By? The Sci-Fi Channel. UNM's dig location was chosen by two discredited UFO believers, Don Schmidt and Tom Carey. Carey and Schmidt acted as technical advisors to the Sci-Fi Channel. Today they'll take to the air in search of the final resting place of the ill-fated spacecraft. Well, if you were going to undertake a, an expensive scientific project, would you rely on Don Schmidt for where to dig? I sure wouldn't, no. So how did Schmidt and Carey know that a UFO crashed right here? Well, they didn't, and neither did UNM. The digging was science. The choosing of the location was not. UNM's research even caught the attention of the governor. In a briefing, Bill Dolman explained how UNM's archaeologists discovered a gouge in the prairie. The exciting part about this was that, wow, we've got a stratigraphic anomaly right where there should be one. Just finding a furrow here at this spot near Corona in no way proves that an alien spaceship crashed there in 1947. The Sci-Fi Channel paid UNM almost $26,000. The excavation lasted two weeks. Bags of dirt and artifacts were recovered for laboratory analysis. But when it was all over, UNM came up empty-handed. Zilch, nothing, nada. Did you find uh, one shred of uh, physical evidence that a UFO crashed at uh, that site? No. Do you fault the University of New Mexico for getting lured into this kind of project? I, I think they would have been wise just to say, we're not gonna do it, find somebody else to do it. That's not what we do, um, pseudoscience for hire. Pseudoscience or not, UNM's contribution to the Roswell legend is memorialized on a carved granite monument erected near the supposed UFO landing site. I think the only thing that would convince the UFO community 
uh, that nothing happened in Roswell would be for aliens to land on the lawn of the White House and come out and say, guys, we had nothing to do with 1947. That wasn't us. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. See, I don't understand why Larry didn't notice those things crashing in the back. The Air Force has always said that there was a secret involved in the Roswell incident, that it was a crash of a balloon that was carrying instruments that were part of a secret government project to listen for and watch for Soviet nuclear tests, the effects of those tests. Uh, uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Thanks, sir. He's always interrupting me on the show, too. What? Um, <laughs> have you heard anything from the UFO believers whose photographs you put up there uh, uh, as you discuss the beliefs that they have, they're doggedly holding on to? Uh, do, you, well, do you get flack from the community? When, when the story aired, yeah. yes, we got a lot of flack from a lot of people. And, and we expected it. Um, they did not like our findings, what we said. Um, and uh, we also heard from uh, Don Schmidt, who uh, resented us calling him discredited. Um, but yeah, we, we got a lot of flack from UFO believers for this story. Did they threaten legal action? Did that cause any problems for... I, you know, I... Um, uh, there was no legal action. I mean, we didn't libel anybody. Um, yeah, I guess if we, had, if we libeled anybody, it would have been these Roswell aliens, and uh, they didn't file anything. So, um, but yeah, we got a, we got a lot of flack. We expected it. That you know, you're, you're not going to convince believers just by a, a new story. I mean, they're not going to look at this and and say, well. Oh, you know, that's interesting. I think you're right. People don't do that, so. Uh, I was going to ask, um, in terms of, you know, in terms of, I mean, most of what you do is, you know, it, it's corrupt. And it's, I mean, we've all watched you for, for years and years and awards. I mean, there's always like, Larry Barker tonight, and it's this. And, but, but so this is a different sort of beat. So I'm curious as to, because you're so known for, mostly doing non-weird, non-paranormal, non-UFO stuff. Um, did you get any pushback from the stage managers who like, Larry, I, what's this UFO crap you want us to do? No, and that's an interesting question. This is not exactly the kind of story that we investigate. But when we proposed it, I mean, there is so, you live in New Mexico um, and uh, when you go to visit friends and relatives out of state and you say you live in New Mexico, the, 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 the thing that people ask about is Roswell. I mean, the, uh, uh, the soundbite from Bill Dolman at the University of New Mexico, he said, if you live in, in outer Mongolia and don't speak a word of in English and you hear the word Roswell and they think aliens. So international, it has international interest. So here we are in New Mexico, ground zero for, um, for Roswell. And I said, you know, the University of New Mexico uh, actually undertook a scientific expedition uh, at Roswell to verify the crash landing of site. And I said, I want to look at it. They didn't hesitate for a second. They said, go for it. So, um, there, and it, it was of interest on a lot of levels. First was the misuse of um, uh, public resources and uh, uh, for the, a, a credible scientific organization to use their, their expertise here. Was it uh, a good use of, of the educational resources of UNM? Well. We presented it, and uh, you all can make up your own mind on that. So, um, yes, sir. Yeah, the observation uh, that 
human souls need myths, magic, and miracles. And we're wired for it. And uh, collectively, uh, uh, it's called pseudoscience, unfortunately, which I define pseudoscience as science which ain't so. That's all I have to say. It's never going to go away later either because you're going to get a full time job. Yeah, no, no. It's, it, um, you know, did we debunk the Roswell story? No, of course not. We did one news story. Not going to change it. Not one person is going to look at that and say, huh, you're right. All we did is present the facts, what we know. That's all we did. Yes, sir. So we're a nonprofit. We do science communication. We make documentary films and stuff. And after payroll, our biggest expense is our insurance. You know, insurance, DMO insurance. Do you guys, I mean, obviously, the station has all of this kind of insurance, but do you have guidelines that you have to follow in terms of don't say things that sound mean about people? And are there black and white rules, or is it kind of gray area? No, I mean, you know, it's in our business, journalism, um, of course there are rules and uh, you don't want to um, violate people's rights or their privacy. Um, uh, we don't want to libel somebody. Um, yeah, we don't want to trespass. That guy, that guy, saying that guy was discredited, you, you, you mentioned that, that's a good example. I would be hesitant to say that. Um, you know, he was, he was upset that we said that he was discredited. And um, in response to his concerns, you know, we had uh, quite a bit of uh, literature and news articles and that sort of thing showing where things that Don Schmidt had said are just wrong. And so uh, using that as our evidence that he was, quote, discredited, um, he went away. But yeah, you know, we have, we have to be careful. Every single story we do is we don't want to violate people's rights. We don't want to libel somebody. We don't want to trespass. Um, you know, we want to be very upfront in what we do and how we do it. So it's very important to us, um, whether it's Roswell, Aztec, or anything else. It's the same principles of journalism apply to this story as to every other story we do. And that's how we approach it. Um, for, the, for the next story, we, we are moving away from um, UFOs to uh, uh, mythical creatures. Um, I worked with uh, Ben Radford here on, on this one, and uh, this, this is really different. But you, but you will, um, you will get a kick out of it. Yeah. A creature that pounces on hapless victims, rips out their throats, and drinks their blood. Running into one of those would scare the heck out of me. And millions here in the Americas, many in New Mexico, truly do fear the chupacabra. Others think it's a joke, a hoax. How did the chupacabra story start, and why is it so powerful? Here's News 13 investigative reporter Larry Barker. Among the monsters said to roam the world's desolate deserts and dense jungles, perhaps none is more feared than the bloodthirsty chupacabra. It's a mysterious vampire beast of mythical proportions, right up there with the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, and the Abominable Snowman. It's the Chupacabra. Everyone knows the name, but no one knows where they live or what they look like. You see, the legend of this vicious monster is as elusive as the beast itself. To some people, it's a joke. To many people, it's a very real creature. Ben Radford is a creature hunter of sorts. He's researched Bigfoot, lake monsters, aliens, and ghosts. Now, he's taking on the Chupacabra. Radford is managing editor of a science journal, The Skeptical Inquirer. He is known internationally for his science-based investigations. Now, after a five-year search, Radford has uncovered the secret of the chupacabra. Did your grandfather tell you the story about chupacabra when you were a little kid? 
My grandfather didn't tell me that story. In fact, he couldn't have because the chupacabra is only, uh, only dates back to 1995. According to Radford, the entire chupacabra phenomena, the monster, the books, documentaries, the whole legend was created just 16 years ago from a single confused incident on a sun-drenched Caribbean island. Mark your calendar. It was the second week of August, 1995. I can tell you exactly where the legend was born. It was born in the suburb of Canovanas, outside of uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. It all traced back to one woman named Madeline Tolentino who saw this, this bizarre creature outside her house. Canovanas is a Puerto Rican community about the size of Farmington. During the week of August 7, 1995, on this residential street, a housewife named Madeline Tolentino spied something out of this world. She saw this weird thing. It was about three to five feet high, had spikes down the back, had either black or red eyes, sort of alien-like. Um, and she saw it for, for a few minutes and it scattered off into the, uh, into the woods. And from that point, the chupacabra was born. The creature she described looked something like this. It had three fingers, grayish skin, and skipped like a kangaroo but had no tail. The local newspaper dubbed the beast El Chupacabra. Never mind, in 1995, there was no such thing as a monster called a chupacabra. You see, back then, the name referred to a nocturnal bird called a whippoorwill, which some believe sucked milk out of goats. However, once the tabloids got a hold of Madeline Tolentino's beast, there was no stopping the story of a bloodthirsty menace on a rampage. Did Madeline spot an alien critter that night? No one had reported seeing this creature before. But hold on, we have seen it before. Madeline Tolentino's chupacabra bears an eerie resemblance to this Hollywood image. Meet Sill, the terrifying beast that ran amok in the movie Species. Call it coincidence or call it invention of a legend. But just weeks before she spotted a strange creature beside her driveway, Madeline Tolentino admitted she sat in a movie theater and watched the science fiction thriller Species. Ben Radford interviewed Madeline Tolentino. I think she genuinely believes that she saw this. I, I, I don't think she's a hoaxer. I don't think she's a liar. I think that she simply confused a monster that she saw in a film with real life. Radford calls Tolentino's story dubious, nonsensical, and contradictory. Scary monster stories never really die. They just get, well, scarier. And that's certainly true in the case of the chupacabra. You see, out here, legendary tall tales are just part of our Western lore. Even though the creature Tolentino described was never seen again, chupacabra hysteria has gone global. That chupacabra wants to eat that gold. People write songs about the chupacabra. There's chupacabra figurines. There's chupacabra board games. There are people who spend their lives looking for the chupacabra. Today you hear about chupacabra sightings all the time. When the carcass of a dead fish was found on Albuquerque's west side, some speculated it was the blood-sucking monster. In the last 10 years, chupacabra just means anything weird. It means some dead animal of some sort that we can't identify. Find a diseased dog or coyote and you'll find someone who says it's chupacabra. However, in every case, DNA tests show these strange dead creatures are just dead animals. The media had, an, had a very, very active role in promoting the, the chupacabra lore and still does to this day. I mean, uh, hardly a year goes by when someone doesn't find some, some dead dog somewhere in Texas and calls it the chupacabra until the tests come in. Radford calls it the beast that never was, yet the myth continues. Aren't you a bit of a spoiler? Come on. I don't think so. You have this creature that's so well known all around the world, this vampire creature, and to be able to definitively solve it, to, to sort of encapsulate it and say, this is all the elements to it, I think it is more fascinating than the myth. Despite the evidence, there is still a part in all of us that wants to believe in an elusive, blood-sucking vampire beast that lurks in the shadows. I would say it is no more and no less as real as Santa Claus. The Chupacabra is dead. Long live the Chupacabra. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. Yes, Virginia, there is a chupacabra. You can check out Ben Radford's book, Tracking the Chupacabra at krqe.com. Just click news links.
So, uh, questions about the chupacabra? Ben, did we do okay? Uh, you, do, you did great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. The uh, yes, ma'am. You, you have to speak up. Uh, doing all of this investigative reporting and debunking these myths, do you ever get frustrated with things like, I don't know, the inhumane people and stuff that like perpetuate this nonsense? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. Do you, know, hard, do you feel any sort of way about like the ancient aliens, for example, who just perpetuate nonsense to people as fact? You know, all we can do is present the legend and and try to present the, what we know and present the facts. And whether it's UFOs or chupacabra or any other uh, uh, myth um, for which there are no, there is no scientific evidence, all we can do is present what we know. Um, if there was even a hint of scientific evidence about chupacabra, it would have been in our story, I promise you. Um, we don't just debunk uh, myths because we don't think it's true. If there's evidence out there, uh, let's see it, we will analyze it and see if it, is, uh, if it is science or if it's pseudoscience. And just particularly with um, chupacabra, so much out there that's presented as science uh, turns out to be pseudoscience. Um, if it was there, we, we would love to see it. If, if that creature was real, um, uh, I'd love it to be real. And let me just add that, that in the course of, 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 that, of taking that and all that, if at some point you had come to me and said, Ben, what about this? Or there's this there's this body here. Or in this case, I'd be like, oh my god, let's look at it. Right? I mean, I wouldn't be like, oh no, we're not going to discuss that. It's like, yeah, Larry, let's figure this out. So that that sort of ties into what you're saying. I would have been I would have been delighted if you had had given me pushback and said you got something wrong. I'd be like, oh, did I? Cool, let's check it out. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, if if you haven't uh, read Ben's book. It, it, it is a great read, and I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, it, it really is. Um, it's science, and it's a inter very interesting subject, particularly in New Mexico. So um, the, the, the last story is, uh, uh, since we're talking about um, uh, mythical monsters, uh, we uh, took on Bigfoot. Now... We didn't just decide, hey, let's talk about Bigfoot. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, we found out that uh, the head of the University of New Mexico Gallup campus had used public university funds to launch an expedition in search of Bigfoot in the Sandia Mountains. Now, that caught our attention. Um, uh, the, this guy was the head of the University Gallup campus, and he used public funds to search for Bigfoot. Did you know there was a search in the Sandia Mountains last year for Bigfoot? There sure was. Did it find any trace of that legendary beast? It sure didn't. Did you know who paid for that well-funded expedition? Well, you probably don't, but News 13 investigative reporter Larry Barker does, and it is one tall tale. We do have cases where people have been attacked. We have cases where animals have been killed. Bigfoot? That's never been documented. Um, le leprechauns haven't been documented either. Is there any other university in the United States or that is researching Bigfoot? I don't know, but I don't think so. There's only one way to describe what's happened at the University of New Mexico. Bizarre. 
Dr. Bob Frank is UNM's president. I didn't know about this until you contacted us to bring it to our attention. At the center of this controversy is a legendary creature called Bigfoot. In the animal kingdom, Bigfoot is right up there with the Loch Ness Monster, unicorns, and werewolves. According to folklore, it's a hairy, human-like beast that supposedly lives in the woods. Even though there has never been any scientific evidence the creature actually exists, UNM's Gallup campus is front and center in the hunt for Bigfoot. And leading the charge is Dr. Christopher Dyer. I haven't seen it, but I've heard it. I've had a rock thrown at me by one at night, I think, and I've certainly smelled it <laughs> because they have a very strong odor. From his office in western New Mexico, Dr. Dyer heads up UNM's Gallup campus. When he's not presiding over students and faculty, Dr. Dyer traipses through the outback investigating legendary creatures. Spend a few hours with Dr. Dyer and he'll tell you all about the Bigfoot hairs he's collected, the suspicious footprints he's found, and the evidence he's collected. Hey, we're talking to Nicolaius about a sighting and an, and an encounter with, with uh, one of the hairy people, as we call them up here in First Nation, who ran into a tree on his way down a hill. Yes, sir. Dr. Dyer claims he pursues Bigfoot only on his own time. However, a News 13 investigation finds Dyer hit up taxpayers more than $7,000 in Bigfoot-related expenses. Dave Thomas is a scientist and lecturer at New Mexico Tech. When you're um, expending the, the resources of uh, taxpaying citizens on, on what is uh, completely pseudoscience, that's, that's a betrayal of the, the public trust. That's a betrayal of the mission of the university. In February, Dyer organized an on-campus Bigfoot conference. It was the largest and most well-attended event in the history of this campus. UNM shelled out thousands of dollars in advertising, airfare for the guest speakers, hotels, and per diem. Self-professed Bigfoot expert Dr. Jeff Meldrum was handed a thousand dollar honorarium plus expenses. There are these uh, beings that uh, have, as has been suggested, have been here for a long, long time, obviously. The conference had everything going for it, everything but Balance. The presentation in Gallup was not balanced. Ben Radford is a researcher, author, and managing editor of the scientific journal The Skeptical Inquirer. Two people who have professed to be experts on the subject of Bigfoot giving this talk, this exciting talk, and yet where were the skeptics? Um, there's many Bigfoot skeptics here in New Mexico they could have invited. Following the two-day conference, Dr. Dyer hit the road in search of the elusive beast. It may be the first taxpayer-supported Bigfoot expedition in history. Armed with binoculars and other paraphernalia, Dr. Dyer and some of his pals headed here to the Sandias in search of the elusive Bigfoot. UNM paid for everything, hotels in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, meals, mileage, even seven pairs of snowshoes. No students or UNM faculty were invited. There was a field trip and taxpayers paid for that. Mm -hmm. So if you went dollars. to the Sandias to look for Bigfoot, mm -hmm. right? We took one day and we went up there, yeah, walked around. Did you see Bigfoot? No, but we looked at Habitat. <laughs> we didn't see it. One member of the search party was Bigfoot believer George Harvey. So why should taxpayers pay for George Harvey to look for Bigfoot in the Sandias? Well, he's very, very poor, actually and his fam whole family is poor. So no, I don't think he could have paid for it himself. What are the odds then that Bigfoot exists here in the Sandia Mountains? I, I think the odds against would be billions to one. It makes as much sense for uh, UNM to have a Bigfoot hunt in Sandia as it would be for UNM to, to host a uh, field trip to find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Well, you know, if you want to spend the day hiking the Sandias, go for it. Uh, I would just say don't use the public's money. The track record of success for Bigfoot searches is exactly zero. It's not 1%, it's not 10%, it's not 30%, it's exactly zero. So there has never been a successful Bigfoot search. I use discretionary funds for things that I think are, are of merit, and that could include field work of some kind or research of some kind. P 
people use monies from the taxpayers to do research but or to Bigfoot, go on expeditions. But, but for Bigfoot? For Bigfoot or whatever. When you add it all up, since February, taxpayers have shelled out $7,458 for Bigfoot-related activities. State Senator George Munoz lives in Gallup and serves on the Legislative Finance Committee. Have you spoken to Dr. Dyer about his interest in Bigfoot? I know I haven't. I don't know if I can keep a straight face and, and, and ask him why he's spending this amount of money on something that doesn't really exist. Well, how do you explain this situation to your colleagues in the state Senate? I can't. How, how can I say we have a director that's hunting a mythical legend? They'll laugh me out of the room. It's not uh, expanding the frontier of science. It's wasting you know, time and resources on uh, something that, that is as ephemeral as, as leprechauns. It's uh, really a, a waste of uh, scientific resources. What's your advice to Dr. Dyer as it relates to his pursuit of Bigfoot at public expense? Pay back the money. Dr. Dyer's Bigfoot expeditions at taxpayer expense may be coming to an end. What is your direction to Dr. Dyer as it relates to field trips in search of Bigfoot? Well, Dr. Dyer needs to be much more thoughtful about how he undertakes these activities. The type of uh, expedition that just took place was not appropriate and won't occur in that manner again. Larry Barker, KRQE News 13. We have a photo gallery, Sasquatch DNA gathering video, and more on the KRQE News app. Hmm. Uh, questions? Did he pay it back? No. He did not. Did he get fired? Uh, no. He, uh, shortly after that story aired, he uh, retired from the university. He still is a, uh, uh, a lecturer. He doesn't live in New Mexico any longer, but he does uh, some lectures for the Gallup campus um, long distance, but not on mythical creatures. Yes, ma'am. When you said that there wasn't that much money spent, do you know how much was there a, a what did he call how much money? Well, in the scheme of things, it was a little over seven thousand that 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 the university spent. The amount of money isn't the issue. Was it a lot of money? No. In the scheme of things, it was very little. But it was just the fact that they used public resources. Um, uh, unauthorized um, uh, for his own uh, personal interests. It was it was a misuse of public money. Um, uh, it happened to be Bigfoot, though so not a lot of money, uh, but the amount of money wasn't the issue. The way he said it, it sounded almost like he spent hundreds, maybe hundreds of dollars, so was the way he implied. Just a, a few dollars. Yeah, just a few dollars was what he said. Yeah, it, you know, it would, you add it all up, it was $7,400. And that's what we did. We just, we added up all the actual expenses. But then there's, we didn't calculate, uh, uh, you know, uh, individual's time. Um, he says he did everything on his own time. We don't know. We couldn't prove it one way or the other, so we don't know. Yes, sir. Well, I was just going to add to that that it seems like at first he was like, well, this is my own time, and just doing this on my own time, and then like, well, you're spending public money. Well, that's okay, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, discretionary money. And, and uh, you know, presidents of colleges do get money to spend on pizza to uh, make the students happy. So, you know, it, it, there is a legitimate um, sort of slush fund for, for things like that, but, but this one was especially late. Yes, yes ma'am. Um, I work with, uh, the area I work in is mostly psychic mediums. Uh, what I've discovered is that a lot of the news stations, especially the morning news, they enable them by giving them platforms and absolutely zero criticism at all. I'm, no skepticism at all. And I'm wondering, is there a tactic we should be using? Because I, what I do is I write articles about what they did. I try to talk to the news agencies and 
said that was harmful, here's how you're fooled, but I'm having zero success. They never respond to me. Is there a tip you should give me to get the morning news stations, mailings morning news, to knock it off? Yeah, um, I fight that all the time. Um, and not just my own employer, but um, even after all the stories we've done on UFOs and uh, Chupacabra and Bigfoot, um, the stories we did, I, I, I wish that my colleagues in this business would be skeptical, stick to the facts, and report what the facts are. That's our role, is we are, um, we are observers. But we have to be fair and accurate. And I, I will tell you a little story. Um, and this is maybe 10, 15 years ago. There was a, um, somebody had come forward and said that they had seen a UFO. And they went to the, the news station and, uh, and one of our reporters actually um, did a news story on what this person had said that they saw. Now, I did not know that they were going to do the story. I didn't know about the story until it aired. But we did a story about somebody who said that they saw a UFO, and they were interviewed. Now, did they interview a skeptic? No. All they did is interview this one person, and I, I, they may have had some pictures. I can't remember. But, I think it was a bird. Uh, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know. But we actually did a news story, and this story was promoted about the possibility that this New Mexico person had seen a UFO. Hmm. I saw that story after it aired, and I, I will tell you that it is the only time that I have raised my voice with a colleague because I, I was just embarrassed for our newsroom that we would do a story based on a myth, on what somebody had just said had seen a, a, a UFO. And the way the story was written, it raised the possibility that indeed they did see a UFO. And that's how it was promoted. And I, I know why they promoted it, because people will watch. If you say, hey, coming up, uh, coming up after the break, we'll talk to uh, somebody who may have seen a UFO. Well, are people going to watch that? You bet. Was it responsible journalism? No way. I see it all the time, local, even national news media. They do these stories. Uh, somebody finds a diseased dog on the West Mesa, and um, uh, it's promoted as a possibly somebody found the carcass of Chupacabra. Um, it happens all the time. It, is it responsible journalism? Absolutely not. But I am responsible for what I do. If my name is on it, I guarantee you, uh, it will be responsible journalism. And that's why we do these stories, because there is a lot of public interest in these stories. But it doesn't mean that they're real. But I am only responsible for what I have my name on. Um, if, my colleagues do stories, and probably tonight, there, maybe there will be a story about a Bigfoot sighting or a UFO crash landing on the West Mesa. Um, I don't, I'm not consulted on it. I don't, I don't know. I, I find out about it when I see it on the air. So that's all I can do. Uh, any more questions? I got a comment. Yeah. D. Oh, so uh, after Larry's piece on the uh, Bigfoot uh, saga ran, um, Rob Kreider, uh, one of the speakers at that uh, Bigfoot convention in an Albuquerque sort of adventurist, uh, was, was really upset on, on Facebook. So I said, well, Rob, get your best Bigfoot evidence, come down to NMSR and, and show us what you got. So he did, and uh, had, had a nice uh, colloquial get-together. Uh, and, and so his best evidence 
uh, was just a, a grainy picture, and, and I show it in my classes. Um, the, the big picture, it just looks like a forest, and as you zoom in, there's maybe a shadow of a tree, and then his team uh, sculpted out the portions that didn't look like Bigfoot, and the shadow that remained looked like a, maybe a nine-foot Bigfoot, but it was, um, it was like what uh, Celestia was showing this morning with the, the pareidolia. Um, there wasn't a Bigfoot there. So, um, but that was, that was an interesting uh, sort of follow-up on your... Well, on after your, after uh, he met with you and showed his evidence, did he say, you know, Dave, you're right. No, I, I apologize to you. No, no, we, 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 we got it right. You're right, Dave, and we're wrong. No, nope. no, he, he still says, no, Oxford uh, uh, kept their uh, Bigfoot samples that they sent him, and they didn't test them like they should have, and this, that, and the other. And so what I, what I told him was, uh, look at the animal planet. They, they make robot penguins that live with penguins and get close-up pictures. If you can get, not from two miles away, but from two feet away, a video of the Bigfoot family, people will believe you. Uh, but they haven't done that yet. Okay. What well, big hand for Larry. Thank, thank you very much. Don't you call me, cause I can't go Someone's wrong on the internet, don't you know?